to culture. You can't consume much if you sit still and read books. Do I look all right? Lenina asked. Her jacket was made of bottle green acetate cloth with green viscose fur at the cuffs and collar. 800 simple lifers were mowed down by machine guns at Golders Green. Ending is better than mending, mending, ending is better than mending. Green corduroy shorts and white viscose woolen stockings turned down below the knee. Then came the famous British Museum massacre. 2,000 culture fans guessed with dichlorethyl sulfide. A green and white jockey cap shaded Lenina's eyes, her shoes were bright green and highly polished. In the end, said Mustafa Mond, the controllers realized that force was no good. The slower but infinitely sure methods of ectogenesis, neo-Pavlovian conditioning, and hypnopedia. And round her waist she wore a silver-mounted green Morocco surrogate cartridge belt, bulging, for Lenina was not a free martin, with the regulation supply of contraceptives. The discoveries of Fitzner and Kawaguchi were at last made use of. An intensive propaganda against viviparous reproductive nine ons equals. Perfect, cried Fanny enthusiastically. She could never resist Lenina's charm for long. And what a perfectly sweet Malthusian belt. Accompanied by a campaign against the past, by the closing of museums, the blowing up of historical monuments, luckily most of them had already been destroyed during the Nine Years' War, by the suppression of all books published before AF. 150 Ah simply must get one like it, said Fanny. There were some things called the pyramids, for example. My old black patent bandolier and a man called Shakespeare. You've never heard of them of course. It's an absolute disgrace that bandolier of mine. Such are the advantages of a really scientific education. The more stitches the less riches, the more stitches the nine fashio three. The introduction of our Ford's first T-model TV had it nearly three months. Chosen as the opening date of the new era. Ending is better than mending, ending is better. There was a thing, as I've said before, called Christianity. Ending is better than mending. The ethics and philosophy of underconsumption T love new clothes, I love new clothes, I love. So essential when there was underproduction, but in an age of machines and the fixation of nitrogen positively a crime against society. Henry Foster gave it me. All crosses had their tops cut and became TS. There was also a thing called God. It's real Morocco surrogate. We have the world state now and Ford's Day celebrations, and community sings, and solidarity services. Ford, how I hate them. Bernard Marx was thinking. There was a thing called heaven, but all the same they used to drink enormous quantities of alcohol. Tyke meat, like so much meat. There was a thing called the soul and a thing called immortality. Do ask Henry where he got it. But they used to take morphia and cocaine. And what makes it worse, she thinks of herself as meat. Two thousand pharmacologists and biochemists were subsidized in AF. 178 he does look glum, said the assistant predestinator pointing at Bernard Marx. Six years later it was being produced commercially. The perfect drug. Let's bait him. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. Glum, Marx, glum. The clap on the shoulder made him start, look up. It was that brute Henry Foster. What you need is a gram of soma. All the advantages of Christianity and alcohol, none of their defects. Ford, I should like to kill him. But all he did was to say. No, thank you, and fend off the proffered tube of tablets. Take a holiday from reality whenever you like, and come back without so much as a headache or a mythology. Take it, insisted Henry Foster, take it. Stability was practically assured. Nine said the assistant predestinator citing a piece of homely. One cubic centimeter cures ten gloomy sentiments, hypnopstic wisdom. It only remained to conquer old age. Damn you, damn you, shouted Bernard Marx. Hoity toity. Gonadal hormones, transfusion of young blood, magne nine some salts. And do remember that a gram is better than a dam. They went out, laughing. All the physiological stigmata of old age have been abolished. And along with them, of course don't forget to ask him about that Malthusian belt, said Fanny. Along with them all the old man's mental peculiarities. Characters remain constant throughout a whole lifetime. Two rounds of obstacle golf to get through before dark. I must fly. Work, play at 60 our powers and tastes are what they were at 17. Old men in the bad old days used to renounce, retire, take to religion, spend their time reading, thinking thinking. Idiots, swine. Bernard Marx was saying to himself, as he walked down the corridor to the lift. Now such is progress the old men work, the old men copulate, the old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure, not a moment to sit down and think or if ever by some unlucky chance such a crevice of time should yawn in the solid substance of their distractions, there is always soma. Delicious soma, half a gram for a half holiday, a gram. For a weekend, two grams for a trip to the gorgeous east, three for a dark eternity on the moon, returning whence they find themselves on the other side of the crevice, safe on the solid ground of daily labor and distraction, scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl, from electro. Magnetic golf course to, go away, little girl, shouted the DHC angrily. Go away, little boy. Can't you see that his Ford ship's busy? Go and do your erotic play somewhere else. Suffer little children, said the controller. Slowly, majestically, with a faint humming of machinery, the conveyors moved forward, 33 centimeters an hour. In the red darkness glinted innumerable rubies. Part, 
I the lift was crowded with men from the Alpha changing rooms, and Lena's entry was greeted by many friendly nods and smiles. She was a popular girl and, at one time or another, had spent a night with almost all of them. They were dear boys, she thought, as she returned their salutations. Charming boys. Still, she did wish that George Edsel's ears weren't quite so big, perhaps he'd been given just a spot too much parathyroid at meter 328. And looking at Benito Hoover, she couldn't help remembering that he was really too hairy when he took his clothes off. Turning, with eyes a little saddened by the recollection of Benito's curly blackness, she saw in a corner the small thin body, the melancholy face of Bernard Marx. Bernard, she stepped up to him. I was looking for you. Her voice rang clear above the hum of the mounting lift. The others looked round curiously. I wanted to talk to you about our New Mexico plan. Out of the tail of her eye. She could see Benito Hoover gaping with astonishment. The gape annoyed her. Surprised I shouldn't be begging to go with him again, she said to herself. Then aloud, and more warmly than ever, I'd simply jove to come with you for a week in July, she went on. Anyhow, she was publicly proving her unfaithfulness to Henry. Fanny ought to be pleased, even though it was Bernard. That is, Lenina gave him her most deliciously significant smile, if you still want to have me. Bernard's pale face flushed. What on earth for, she wondered, astonished, but at the same time touched by this strange tribute to her power. Hadn't we better talk about it somewhere else, he stammered, looking horribly uncomfortable. As though I'd been saying something shocking, thought Lenina. He couldn't look more upset if D made a dirty joke asked him who his mother was, or something like that. I mean, with all these people about. He was choked with confusion. Lenina's laugh was frank and wholly unmalicious. How funny you are, she said, and she quite genuinely did think him funny. You'll give me at least a week's warning, won't you, she went on in another tone. I suppose we take the blue Pacific rocket? Does it start from the Charing Tea Tower? Or is it from Hampstead? Before Bernard could answer, the lift came to a standstill. Roof, called a creaking voice. Underscore the liftman was a small simian creature, dressed in the black tunic of an epsilon minus semi moron. Roof. He flung open the gates. The warm glory of afternoon sunlight made him start and blink his eyes. Oh, Roof, he repeated in a voice of rapture. He was as though suddenly and joyfully awakened from a dark annihilating stupor. Roof. He smiled up with a kind of doggly expectant adoration into the faces of his passengers. Talking and laughing together, they stepped out into the light. The liftman looked after them. Roof, he said once more, questioningly. Then a bell rang and from the ceiling of the lift a loudspeaker began, very softly and yet very imperiously, to issue its commands. Go down, it said, go down. Floor 18. Go down, go down. Floor 18. Go down, go, the liftman slammed the gates, touched a button and instantly dropped back into the droning twilight of the well, the twilight of his own habitual stupor. It was warm and bright on the roof. The summer afternoon was drowsy with the hum of passing helicopters, and the deeper drone of the rocket planes hastening, invisible, through the bright sky five or six miles overhead was like a caress on the soft air. Bernard Marx drew a deep breath. He looked up into the sky and round the blue horizon and finally down into Lenina's face. Isn't it beautiful? His voice trembled a little. She smiled at him with an expression of the most sympathetic understanding. Simply perfect for obstacle golf, she answered rapturously. And now I must fly, Bernard. Henry. Gets cross if I keep him waiting. Let me know in good time about the date. And waving her hand, she ran away across the white flat roof towards the hangars. Bernard stood watching the retreating twinkle of the white stockings, the sunburnt knees vivaciously bending and unbending again, again, and the softer rolling of those well-fitted corduroy shorts beneath the bottle green jacket. His face wore an expression of pain. T should say she was pretty, said a loud and cheery voice just behind him. Bernard started and looked around. The chubby red face of Benito Hoover was beaming down at him beaming with manifest cordiality. Benito was notoriously good-natured. People said of him that he could have got through life without ever touching Soma. The malice and bad tempers from which other people had to take holidays never afflicted him. Reality for Benito was always sunny. Pneumatic too. And how? Then, in another tone, but, I say, he went on, you look glum. What you need is a gram of Soma. Diving into his right-hand trouser pocket. Benito produced a file. One cubic centimeter cures ten gloomy. But, I say. Bernard had suddenly turned and rushed away. Benito stared after him. What can be the matter with the fellow, he wondered, and, shaking his head, decided that the story about the alcohol having been put into the poor chaps. Blood surrogate must be true. Touched his brain, I suppose. He put away the Soma bottle and taking out a packet of sex hormone chewing gum, stuffed a plug into his cheek and walked slowly away towards the hangars, ruminating. Henry Foster had had his machine wheeled out of its lockup and, when Lenina arrived, was already seated in the cockpit, waiting. Four minutes late, was all his comment, as she climbed in beside him. He started the engines and threw the helicopter screws into gear. The machine shot vertically into the air. Henry accelerated, the humming of the propeller shrilled from hornet to wasp, from wasp to mosquito, the speedometer showed that they were rising at the best part of two kilometers a minute. London diminished beneath them. The huge table-topped buildings were no more, in a few seconds, than a bed of geometrical mushrooms sprouting from the green of park and garden. In the midst of them, thin-stalked, a taller, slenderer fungus, 
the Charing T Tower lifted towards the sky a disk of shining concrete. Like the vague torsos of fabulous athletes, huge fleshy clouds lolled on the blue air above their heads. Out of one of them suddenly dropped a small scarlet insect, buzzing as it fell. There's the red rocket, said Henry, just come in from New York. Looking at his watch. Seven minutes behind time, he added, and shook his head. These Atlantic services they're really scandalously unpunctual. He took his foot off the accelerator. The humming of the screws overhead dropped an octave and a half, back through Wasp and Hornet to Bumblebee, to Cockchafer, to Stag Beetle. The upward rush of the machine slackened off, a moment later they were hanging motionless in the air. Henry pushed at a lever, there was a click. Slowly at first, then faster and faster, till it was a circular mist before their eyes, the pro. Peller in front of them began to revolve. The wind of a horizontal speed whistled ever more shrilly in the stays. Henry kept his eye on the revolution counter, when the needle touched the 1200 mark, he threw the helicopter screws out of gear. The machine had enough forward momentum to be able to fly on its planes. Lenina looked down through the window in the floor between her feet. They were flying over the six-kilometer zone of parkland that separated central London from its first ring of satellite suburbs. The green was maggoty with foreshortened life. Forests of centrifugal bumble puppy towers gleamed between the trees. Near Shepherd's Bush 2000 beta minus mixed doubles were playing Riemann surface tennis. A double row of escalator fives courts lined the main road from Notting Hill to Wilsdon. In the Ealing Stadium a Delta gymnastic display and community sing was in progress. What a hideous color khaki is, remarked Lenina, voicing the hypnopstic prejudices of her caste. The buildings of the Hounslow Feely studio covered seven and a half hectares. Near them a black and cocky army of laborers was busy revitrifying the surface of the Great West Road. One of the huge traveling crucibles was being tapped as they flew over. The molten stone poured out in a stream of dazzling incandescence across the road, the asbestos rollers came and went, at the tail of an insulated watering cart the steam rose in white clouds. At Brentford the television corporation's factory was like a small town. They must be changing the shift, said Lenina. Like aphids and ants, the leaf green gamma girls, the black semi-morons swarmed round the entrances, or stood in queues to take their places in the monorail tram cars. Mulberry-colored beta minuses came and went among the crowd. The roof of the main building was alive with the alighting and departure of helicopters. My word, said Lenina, I'm glad I'm not a gamma. Ten minutes later they were at Stoke Poges and had started their first round of obstacle golf. And, part two with eyes for the most part downcast and, if ever they lighted on a fellow creature, at once and furtively averted, Bernard hastened across the roof. He was like a man pursued, but pursued by enemies he does not wish to see, lest they should seem more hostile even than he had supposed, and he himself be made to feel guiltier and even more helplessly alone. That horrible Benito Hoover. And yet the man had meant well enough. Which only made it, in a way, much worse. Those who meant well behaved in the same way as those who meant badly. Even Lenina was making him suffer. He remembered those weeks of timid indecision, during which he had looked and longed and despaired of ever having the courage to ask her. Dared he face the risk of being humiliated by a contemptuous refusal? But if she were to say yes, what rapture? Well, now she had said it and he was still wretched wretched that she should have thought it such a perfect afternoon for obstacle golf, that she should have trotted away to join Henry Foster, that she should have found him funny for not wanting to talk of their most private affairs in public. Wretched, in a word because she had behaved as any healthy and virtuous English girl ought to behave and not in some other, abnormal, extraordinary way. He opened the door of his lockup and called to a lounging couple of Delta Minus attendants to come and push his machine out onto the roof. The hangars were staffed by a single Bokhanovsky group, and the men were twins, identically small, black and hideous. Bernard gave his orders in the sharp, rather arrogant and even offensive tone of one who does not feel himself too secure in his superiority. To have dealings with members of the lower castes was always, for Bernard, a most distressing experience. For whatever the cause, and the current gossip about the alcohol in his blood surrogate may very likely for accidents will happen have been true, Bernard's physique was hardly better than that of the average gamma. He stood eight centimeters short of the standard alpha height and was slender in proportion. Contact with members of the lower castes always reminded him painfully of this physical inadequacy. I am I, and wish I wasn't, his self-consciousness was acute and distressing. Each time he found himself looking on the level, instead of downward, into a delta's face, he felt humiliated. Would the creature treat him with the respect due to his caste? The question haunted him. Not without reason. For gammas, deltas, and epsilons had been to some extent conditioned to associate corporeal mass with social superiority. Indeed, a faint hypnopedic prejudice in favor of size was universal. Hence the laughter of the women to whom he made proposals, the practical joking of his equals among the men. The mockery made him feel an outsider, and feeling an outsider he behaved like one, which increased the prejudice against him and intensified the contempt and hostility aroused by his physical defects. Which in turn increased his sense of being alien and alone. A chronic fear of being slighted made him avoid his equals, made him stand, where his inferiors were concerned, self-consciously on his dignity. How bitterly he envied men like Henry Foster and Benito Hoover. Men who never had to shout at an epsilon to get an order obeyed, men who took their position for granted, men who moved through the caste system as a fish through water so utterly at home as to be unaware. Either of themselves or of the beneficent and comfortable element in which they had their being. Slackly, it seemed to him, and with reluctance, the twin attendants wheeled his plane out on the roof. Hurry up, said Bernard irritably. One of them glanced at him. Was that a kind of bestial derision that he detected in those blank gray eyes? 
Hurry up, he shouted more loudly, and there was an ugly rasp in his voice. He climbed into the plane and, a minute later, was flying southwards, towards the river. The various bureaus of propaganda and the College of Emotional Engineering were housed in a single 60-story building in Fleet Street. In the basement and on the lower floors were the presses and offices of the three great London newspapers The Hourly Radio, an upper cast sheet, in pale green gamma gazette, and, on cocky paper and in words exclusively of one syllable, the Delta Mirror. Then came the bureaus of propaganda by television, by feeling picture, and by synthetic voice and music respectively 22 floors of them. Above were the research laboratories and the padded rooms in which the soundtrack writers and synthetic composers did their delicate work. The top 18 floors were occupied by the College of Emotional Engineering. Bernard landed on the roof of Propaganda House and stepped out. Ring down to MR. Helmholtz Watson, he ordered the Gamma Plus Porter, and tell him that Mr. Bernard Marx is waiting for him on the roof. He sat down and lit a cigarette. Helmholtz Watson was writing when the message came down. Tell him I'm coming at once, he said and hung up the receiver. Then, turning to his secretary, I'll leave you to put my things away, he went on in the same official and impersonal tone, and, ignoring her lustrous smile, got up and walked briskly to the door. He was a powerfully built man, deep-chested, broad-shouldered, massive, and yet quick in his movements, springly, and agile. The round strong pillar of his neck supported a beautifully shaped head. His hair was dark and curly, his features strongly marked. In a forcible emphatic way, he was handsome and looked, as his secretary was never tired of. Repeating, every centimeter and alpha plus. By profession he was a lecturer at the College of Emotional Engineering, Department of Writing, and in the intervals of his educational activities, a working emotional engineer. He wrote regularly for the hourly radio, composed feely scenarios, and had the happiest knack for slogans and hypnopedic rhymes. Able, was the verdict of his superiors. Perhaps, and they would shake their heads, would significantly lower their voices, a little too able. Yes, a little too able, they were right. A mental excess had produced in Helmholtz Watson effects very similar to those which, in Bernard Marx, were the result of a physical defect. Too little bone and brawn had isolated Bernard from his fellow men, and the sense of this apartness, being, by all the current standards, a mental excess, became in its turn a cause of wider separation. That which had made Helmholtz so uncomfortably aware of being himself and all alone was too much ability. What the two men shared was the knowledge that they were individuals. But whereas the physically defective Bernard had suffered all his life from the consciousness of being separate, it was only quite recently that, grown aware of his mental excess, Helmholtz Watson had also become aware of his difference from the people who surrounded him. This escalator squash champion, this indefatigable lover, it was said that he had had 640 different girls in under four years, this admirable committee man and best mixer had realized quite suddenly that sport, women, communal activities were only, so far as he was concerned, second bests. Really, and at the bottom, he was interested in something else. But in what? In what? That was the problem which Bernard had come to discuss with him or rather, since it was always Helmholtz who did all the talking, to listen to his friend discussing, yet once more. Three charming girls from the bureaus of propaganda by synthetic voice waylaid him as he stepped out of the lift. Oh, Helmholtz, darling, do come and have a picnic supper with us on Exmoor. They clung round him imploringly. He shook his head, he pushed his way through them. No, no. We're not inviting any other man. But Helmholtz remained unshaken even by this delightful promise. No, he repeated, I'm busy. And he held resolutely on his course. The girls trailed after him. It was not till he had actually climbed into Bernard's plane and slammed the door that they gave up pursuit. Not without reproaches. These women, he said, as the machine rose into the air. These women. And he shook his head, he frowned. Too awful, Bernard hypocritically agreed, wishing, as he spoke the words, that he could have as many girls as Helmholtz did, and with as little trouble. He was seized with a sudden urgent need to boast. I'm taking Lenin a crown to New Mexico with me, he said in a tone as casual as he could make it. Are you, said Helmholtz, with a total absence of interest. Then after a little pause, this last week or two, he went on, I've been cutting all my committees and all my girls. You can't imagine what a hullabaloo they've been making about it at the college. Still, it's been worth it, I think. The effects, he hesitated. Well, they're odd, they're very odd. A physical shortcoming could produce a kind of mental excess. The process, it seemed, was reversible. Mental excess could produce, for its own purposes, the voluntary blindness and deafness of deliberate solitude, the artificial impotence of asceticism. The rest of the short flight was accomplished in silence. When they had arrived and were comfortably stretched out on the pneumatic sofas in Bernard's room, Helmholtz began again. Speaking very slowly, did you ever feel, he asked, as though you had something inside you that was only waiting for you to give it a chance to come out? Some sort of extra power that you aren't using you know, like all the water that goes down the falls instead of through the turbines. He looked at it. Bernard questioningly. You mean all the emotions one might be feeling if things were different? Helmholtz shook his head. Not quite. I'm thinking of a queer feeling I sometimes get, a feeling that I've got something important to say and the power to say it only I don't know what it is, and I can't make any use of the power. If there was some different way of writing, or else something else to write about he was silent, then, you see, he went on at last, I'm pretty good at inventing phrases you know, the sort of words that suddenly make you jump, 
almost as though you'd sat on a pin, they seem so new and exciting even though they're about something hypnopedically obvious. But that doesn't seem enough. It's not enough for the phrases to be good, what you make with them ought to be good too. But your things are good, Helmholtz. Oh, as far as they go. Helmholtz shrugged his shoulders. But they go such a little way. They aren't important enough, somehow. I feel I could do something much more important. Yes, and more intense, more violent. But what? What is there more important to say? And how can one be violent about the sort of things one's expected to write about? Words can be like x-rays, if you use them properly they'll go through anything. You read and you're pierced. That's one of the things I try to teach my students how to write piercingly. But what on underscore earth is the good of being pierced by an article about a community sing, or the latest improvement in scent organs? Besides, can you make words really piercing you know, like? The very hardest x-rays when you're writing about that sort of thing? Can you say something about nothing? That's what it finally boils down to. I try and I try, hush, said Bernard suddenly, and lifted a warning finger, they listened. I believe there's somebody at the door, he whispered. Helmholtz got up, tiptoed across the room, and with a sharp quick movement flung the door wide open. There was, of course, nobody there. TM sorry, said Bernard, feeling and looking uncomfortably foolish. I suppose I've got things on my nerves a bit. When people are suspicious with you, you start being suspicious with them. He passed his hand across his eyes, he sighed, his voice became plaintive. He was justifying himself. If you knew what P.D. had to put up with recently, he said almost tearfully and the uprush of his self-pity was like a fountain suddenly released. If you only knew. Helmholtz Watson listened with a certain sense of discomfort. Poor little Bernard, he said to himself. But at the same time he felt rather ashamed for his friend. He wished Bernard would show a little more pride. Part L by 8 o'clock the light was failing. The loudspeakers in the tower of the Stoke Poges clubhouse began, in a more than human tenor, to announce the closing of the courses. Lena and Henry abandoned their game and walked back towards the club. From the grounds of the internal and external secretion trust came the lowing of those thousands of cattle which provided, with their hormones and their milk, the raw materials for the great factory at Farnham Royal. An incessant buzzing of helicopters filled the twilight. Every two and a half minutes. A bell and the screech of whistles announced the departure of one of the light monorail trains which carried the lower caste golfers back from their separate course to the metropolis. Lena and Henry climbed into their machine and started off. At 800 feet Henry slowed down the helicopter screws, and they hung for a minute or two poised above the fading landscape. The forest of Burnham Beaches stretched like a great pool of darkness towards the bright shore of the western sky. Crimson at the horizon, the last of the sunset faded, through orange, upwards into yellow and a pale watery green. Northwards, beyond and above the trees, the internal and external secretions factory glared with a fierce electric brilliance from every window of its twenty stories. Beneath them lay the buildings of the golf club the huge lower caste barracks and, on the other side of a dividing wall, the smaller houses reserved for Alpha and Beta members. The approaches to the monorail station were black with the ant-like pollulation of lower caste activity. From under the glass vault a lighted train shot out into the open. Following its southeasterly course across the dark plain their eyes were drawn to the majestic buildings of the Slough Crematorium. For the safety of night-flying planes, its four tall chimneys were floodlighted and tipped with crimson danger signals. It was a landmark. Why do the smokestacks have those things like balconies around them, inquired Lenina. Phosphorus recovery, explained Henry telegraphically. On their way up the chimney the gases go through four separate treatments. P ounce used to go right out of circulation every time they cremated someone. Now they recover over 98% of it. More than a kilo and a half per adult corpse. Which makes the best part of 400 tons of phosphorus every year from England alone. Henry spoke with a happy pride, rejoicing wholeheartedly in the achievement, as though it had been his own. Fine to think we can go on being socially useful even after we're dead. Making plants grow. Lenina, meanwhile, had turned her eyes away and was looking perpendicularly downwards at the monorail station. Fine. She agreed. But queer that alphas and betas won't make any more plants grow than those nasty little gammas and deltas and epsilons down there. All men are physico-chemically equal, said Henry sententiously. Besides, even epsilons perform indispensable services. Even an epsilon, Lenina suddenly remembered an occasion when, as a little girl at school, she had woken up in the middle of the night and become aware for the first time, of the whispering that had haunted all her sleeps. She saw again the beam of moonlight, the row of small white beds, heard once more the soft, soft voice that said, the words were there, unforgotten, unforgettable after so many night-long repetitions everyone works for everyone else. We can't do without anyone. Even epsilons are useful. We couldn't do without epsilons. Everyone works for everyone else. We can't do without anyone. Lennon remembered her first shock of fear and surprise, her speculations through half a wakeful hour, and then, under the influence of those endless repetitions, the gradual soothing of her mind, the soothing, the smoothing, the stealthy creeping of sleep. I suppose epsilons don't really mind being epsilons, she said aloud. Of course they don't. How can they? They don't know what it's like being anything else. We'd mind, of course. But then we've been differently conditioned. Besides, we start with a different heredity. I'm glad I'm not an epsilon, said Lenina, with conviction. And if you were an epsilon, said Henry, your conditioning would have made you no less thankful that you weren't a beta or an alpha. 
he put his forward propeller into gear and headed the machine towards London. Behind them, in the west, the crimson and orange were almost faded, a dark bank of cloud had crept into the zenith. As they flew over the crematorium, the plane shot upwards on the column of hot air rising from the chimneys, only to fall as suddenly when it passed into the descending chill beyond. What a marvelous switchback! Lenina laughed delightedly. But Henry's tone was almost, for a moment, melancholy. Do you know what that switchback was, he said. It was some human being finally and definitely disappearing. Going up in a squirt of hot gas. It would be curious to know who it was a man or a woman, an alpha or an epsilon. He sighed. Then, in a resolutely cheerful voice, anyhow, he concluded, there's one thing we can be certain of, whoever he may have been, he was happy when he was alive. Everybody's happy now. Yes, everybody's happy now, echoed Lenina. They had heard the words repeated a hundred and fifty times every night for twelve years. Landing on the roof of Henry's forty-story apartment house in Westminster, they went straight down to the dining hall. There, in a loud and cheerful company, they ate an excellent meal. Soma was served with the coffee. Lenina took two half-gram tablets and Henry three. At twenty past nine they walked across the street to the newly opened Westminster Abbey Cabaret. It was a night almost without clouds, moonless and starry, but of this on the whole depressing fact Lenina and Henry were fortunately unaware. The electric sky signs effectively shut off the outer darkness. Calvin Stopes and his sixteen saxophonists. From the fagate of the new abbey they. Giant letters invitingly glared. London's finest scent and color organ. All the latest synthetic music. They entered. The air seemed hot and somehow breathless with the scent of amber grease and sandalwood. On the domed ceiling of the hall, the color organ had momentarily painted a tropical sunset. The sixteen saxophonists were playing an old favorite, there ain't no bottle in all the world like that dear little bottle of mine. Four hundred couples were five-stepping round the polished floor. Lenina and Henry were soon the four hundred and first. The saxophonies wailed like melodious cats under the moon, moaned in the alto and tenor registers as though the little death were upon them. Rich with a wealth of harmonics, their tremulous chorus mounted towards a climax, louder and ever louder until at last, with a wave of his hand, the conductor let loose the final shattering note of ether music and blew the sixteen merely human blowers clean out of existence. Thunder in a flat major. And then, in all but silence, in all but darkness, there followed a gradual detergescence, a diminuendo sliding gradually, through quarter tones, down, down to a faintly whispered dominant chord that lingered on, while the 5-4 rhythm still pulsed below, charging the darkened seconds with an intense expectancy. And at last expectancy was fulfilled. There was a sudden explosive sunrise, and simultaneously, the 16 burst into song, Bottle of mine, it's you I've always wanted. Bottle of mine, why was I ever decanted? Skies are blue inside of you, the weather's always fine, for there ain't no bottle in all the world like that dear little bottle of mine. Five-stepping with the other 400 round and round Westminster Abbey, Lenina and Henry were yet dancing in another world the warm, the richly colored, the infinitely friendly world of Soma Holiday. How kind, how good-looking, how delightfully amusing everyone was. Bottle of mine, it's you I've always wanted. But Lenina and Henry had what they wanted. They were inside, here and now safely inside with the fine weather, the perennially blue sky. And when, exhausted, the sixteen had laid by their saxophonies and the synthetic music apparatus was producing the very latest in slow Malthusian blues, they might have been twin embryos gently rocking together on the waves of a bottled ocean of blood surrogate. Good night, dear friends. Good night, dear friends. The loudspeakers veiled their commands in a genial and musical politeness. Good night, dear friends. Obediently, with all the others, Lenina and Henry left the building. The depressing stars had traveled quite some way across the heavens. But though the separating screen of the sky signs had now to a great extent dissolved, the two young people still retained their happy ignorance of the night. Swallowing half an hour before closing time, that second dose of Soma had raised a quite impenetrable wall between the actual universe and their minds. Bottled, they crossed the street, bottled, they took the lift up to Henry's room on the twenty-eighth floor. And yet, bottled as she was, and in spite of that second gram of Soma, Lenina did not forget to take all the contraceptive precautions prescribed by the regulations. Years of intensive hypnopedia and, from twelve to seventeen, Malthusian drill three times a week had made the taking of these precautions almost as automatic and inevitable as blinking. Oh, and that reminds me, she said, as she came back from the bathroom, Fanny Crown wants to know where you found that lovely green Morocco surrogate cartridge belt you gave me. And part two alternate Thursdays were Bernard's solidarity service days. After an early dinner at the Aphroditesum, to which Helmholtz had recently been elected under Rule 2, he took leave of his friend and, hailing a taxi on the roof, told the man to fly to the Fortson community singery. The machine rose a couple of hundred meters, then headed eastwards, and as it turned, there before Bernard's eyes, gigantically beautiful, was the singery. Flood lighted, its 320 meters of white Carrara surrogate gleamed with a snowy incandescence over Ludgate Hill, at each of the four corners of its helicopter platform an immense tea shone crim. Sun against the night, and from the mouths of twenty-four vast golden trumpets rumbled a solemn synthetic music. Damn, I'm late, Bernard said to himself as he first caught sight of Big Henry, the singery clock. And sure enough, as he was paying off his cap, Big Henry sounded the hour. Ford, sang out an immense bass voice from all the golden trumpets. Ford, 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 nine times. Bernard ran for the lift. The great auditorium for Ford's day celebrations and other massed community sings was at the bottom of the building. 
above it, a hundred to each floor, were the seven thousand rooms used by solidarity groups for their fortnight services. Bernard dropped down to floor 33, hurried along the corridor, stood hesitating for a moment outside room 3210, then, having wound himself up, opened the door and walked in. Thank Ford. He was not the last. Three chairs of the twelve arranged round the circular table were still unoccupied. He slipped into the nearest of them as inconspicuously as he could and prepared to frown at the yet later comers whenever they should arrive. Turning towards him, what were you playing this afternoon, the girl on his left inquired. Obstacle, or electromagnetic? Bernard looked at her, Ford, it was Morgana Rothschild, and blushingly had to admit that he had been playing neither. Morgana stared at him with astonishment. There was an awkward silence. Then pointedly she turned away and addressed herself to the more sporting man on her left. A good beginning for a solidarity service, thought Bernard miserably, and foresaw for himself yet another failure to achieve atonement. If only he had given himself time to look around instead of scuttling for the nearest chair. He could have sat between Fifi Bradlaff and Joanna Diesel. Instead of which he had gone and blindly planted himself next to Morgana. Morgana. Ford. Those black eyebrows of hers that eyebrow, rather for they met above the nose. Ford. And on his right was Clara Detterding. True, Clara's eyebrows didn't meet. But she was really too pneumatic. Whereas Fifi and Joanna were absolutely right. Plump, blonde, not too large. And it was that great lout, Tom Kawaguchi, who now took the seat between them. The last arrival was Sarojini Engels. You're late, said the president of the group severely. Don't let it happen again. Sarojini apologized and slid into her place between Jim Bakunovsky and Herbert Bakunin. The group was now complete, the solidarity circle perfect and without flaw. Man, woman, man, in a ring of endless alternation round the table. Twelve of them ready to be made one, waiting to come together, to be fused, to lose their twelve separate identities in a larger being. The president stood up, made the sign of the T and, switching on the synthetic music, let loose the soft indefatigable beating of drums and a choir of instruments near wind and superstring that plangently repeated and underscore repeated the brief and unscapably haunting melody of the first solidarity hymn. Again, again, and it was not the ear that heard the pulsing rhythm, it was the midriff, the wail and clang of those recurring harmonies haunted, not the mind, but the yearning bowels of compassion. The president made another sign of the tea and sat down. The service had begun. The dedicated soma tablets were placed in the center of the table. The loving cup of straw. Berry ice cream soma was passed from hand to hand and, with the formula, I drink to my annihilation, twelve times quaffed. Then to the accompaniment of the synthetic orchestra the first solidarity hymn was sung. Ford, we are twelve, oh, make us one, like drops within the social river, oh, make us now together run as swiftly as thy shining fliver. Twelve yearning stanzas. And then the loving cup was passed a second time. I drink to the greater being was now the formula. All drank. Tirelessly the music played. The drums beat. The crying and clashing of the harmonies were an obsession in the melted bowels. The second solidarity hymn was sung. Come, greater being, social friend annihilating twelve in one. We long to die, for when we end, our larger life has but begun. Again twelve stanzas. By this time the soma had begun to work. Eyes shone, cheeks were flushed, the inner light of universal benevolence broke out on every face in happy, friendly smiles. Even Bernard felt himself a little melted. When Morgana Rothschild turned and beamed at him, he did his best to beam back. But the eyebrow, that black two in one alas, it was still there, he couldn't ignore it, couldn't, however hard he tried. The melting hadn't gone. Far enough. Perhaps if he had been sitting between Fifi and Joanna. For the third time the loving cup went round. I drink to the imminence of his coming, said Morgana Rothschild, whose turn it happened to be to initiate the circular rite. Her tone was loud, exultant. She drank and passed the cup to Bernard. I drink to the imminence of his coming, he repeated, with a sincere attempt to feel that the coming was imminent, but the eyebrow continued to haunt him, and the coming, so far as he was concerned, was horribly remote. He drank and handed the cup to Clara Detterding. It'll be a failure again, he said to himself. I know it will but he went on doing his best to beam. The loving cup had made its circuit. Lifting his hand, the president gave a signal, the chorus broke out into the third solidarity hymn. Feel how the greater being comes. Rejoice and, in rejoicings, die. Melt in the music of the drums. For I am you and you are I. As verse succeeded verse the voices thrilled with an ever. Intenser excitement. The sense of the coming's imminence was like an electric tension in the air. The president switched off the music and, with the final note of the final stanza, there was absolute silence the silence of stretched expectancy quivering and creeping with a galvanic life. The president reached out his hand, and suddenly a voice, a deep strong voice, more musical than any merely human voice. Richer, warmer, more vibrant with love and yearning and compassion, a wonderful, mysterious, supernatural voice spoke from above their heads. Very slowly, oh, Ford, 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 it said diminishingly and on a descending scale. A sensation of warmth radiated thrillingly out from the solar plexus to every extremity of the bodies of those who listened, tears came into their eyes, their hearts, their bowels seemed to move within them, as though with an independent life. Ford, they were melting, Ford, dissolved, dissolved. Then, in another tone, suddenly, startlingly. Listen, trumpeted the voice. Listen. They listened. 
After a pause, sunk to a whisper, but a whisper, somehow, more penetrating than the loudest cry. The feet of the greater being, it went on, and repeated the words, the feet of the greater being. The whisper almost expired. The feet of the greater being are on the stairs. And once more there was silence, and the expectancy, momentarily relaxed, was stretched again, totter, totter, almost to the tearing point. The feet of the greater being oh, they heard them, they heard them, coming softly down the stairs, coming nearer and nearer down the invisible stairs. The feet of the greater being. And suddenly the tearing point was reached. Her eyes staring, her lips parted. Morgana Rothschild sprang to her feet. T hear him, she cried. I hear him. He's coming, shouted Sarojini Engels. Yes, he's coming, I hear him. Fifi Bradlaff and Tom Kawaguchi rose simultaneously to their feet. Oh, oh, oh. Joanna inarticulately testified. He's coming, yelled Jim Bokanovsky. The president leaned forward and, with a touch, released. A delirium of cymbals and blown brass, a fever of tom-toming. Oh, he's coming, screamed Clara Detterding. A.I.E., and it was as though she were having her throat cut. Feeling that it was time for him to do something, Bernard also jumped up and shouted, I hear him, he's coming. But it wasn't true. He heard nothing and, for him, nobody was coming. Nobody in spite of the music, in spite of the mounting excitement. But he waved his arms, he shouted with the best of them, and when the others began to jig and stamp and shuffle, he also jigged and shuffled. Round they went, a circular procession of dancers, each with hands on the hips of the dancer preceding, round and round, shouting in unison, stamping to the rhythm of the music with their feet, beating it, beating it out with hands on the buttocks in front, twelve pairs of hands beating as one, as one, twelve buttocks slap Billy resounding. Twelve is one, twelve is one. I hear him, I hear him coming. The music quickened, faster beat the feet, faster, faster fell the rhythmic hands. And all at once a great synthetic bass boomed out the words which announced the approaching atonement and final consummation of solidarity, the coming of the twelve in one, the incarnation of the greater being. Orgy Porty, it sang, while the tom-toms continued to beat their feverish tattoo, Orgy Porty, Ford, and Fun, kiss the girls and make them one. Boys at one with girls at peace, Orgy Porty gives release. Orgy Porty, the dancers caught up the liturgical refrain, Orgy Porty, Ford, and Fun, kiss the girls, and as they sang, the lights began slowly to fade to fade and at the same time to grow warmer, richer, redder, until at last they were dancing in the crimson twilight of an embryo store. Orgy Porty, in their blood-colored and fetal darkness the dancers continued for a while to circulate, to beat, and beat out the indefatigable rhythm. Orgy Porty. Then the circle wavered, broke, fell in partial disintegration on the ring of couches which surrounded circle enclosing circle the table and its planetary chairs. Orgy Porty. Tenderly the deep voice crooned and cooed, in the red twilight it was as though some enormous negro dove were hovering benevolently over the now prone or supine dancers. They were standing on the roof, Big Henry had just sung eleven. The night was calm and warm. Wasn't it wonderful, said Fifi Bradlaff. Wasn't it simply wonderful? She looked at Bernard with an expression of rapture, but of rapture in which there was no trace of agitation or excitement for to be excited is still to be. Unsatisfied. Hers was the calm ecstasy of achieved consummation, the peace, not of mere vacant satiety and nothingness, but of balanced life, of energies at rest and in equilibrium. A rich and living peace. For the solidarity service had given as well as taken, drawn off only to replenish. She was, full, she was made perfect, she was still more than merely herself. Didn't you think it was wonderful, she insisted, looking into Bernard's face with those supernaturally shining eyes. Yes, I thought it was wonderful, he lied and looked away, the sight of her transfigured face was at once an accusation and an ironical reminder of his own separateness. He was as miserably isolated now as he had been when the service began more isolated by reason of his unreplenished emptiness, his dead satiety. Separate and unatoned, while the others were being fused into the greater being, alone even in Morgana's embrace much more alone, indeed, more hopelessly himself than he had ever been in his life before. He had emerged from that crimson twilight into the common electric glare with a self-consciousness intensified to the pitch of agony. He was utterly miserable, and perhaps, her shining eyes accused him, perhaps it was his own fault. Quite wonderful, he repeated, but the only thing he could think of was Morgana's eyebrow. Part one odd, 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 was Lenin's verdict on Bernard Marx. So odd, indeed, that in the course of the succeeding weeks she had wondered more than once whether she shouldn't change her mind about the New Mexico holiday, and go instead to the North Pole with Benito Hoover. The trouble was that she knew the North Pole, had been there with George Edsel only last summer, and what was more, found it pretty grim. Nothing to do, and the hotel too hopelessly old-fashioned no television laid on in the bedrooms, no scent organ, only the most putrid synthetic music, and not more than twenty-five escalator squash courts for over two hundred guests. No, decidedly she couldn't face the North Pole again. Added to which, she had only been to America. Once before. And even then, how inadequately. A cheap weekend in New York had it been with Jean-Jacques Habibullah or Bakanovsky Jones. She couldn't remember. Anyhow, it was of absolutely no importance. The prospect of flying west again, and for a whole week, was very inviting. Moreover, for at least three days of that week they would be in the Savage Reservation. Not more than half a dozen people in the whole center had ever been inside a Savage Reservation. As an Alpha Plus psychologist, 
Bernard was one of the few men she knew entitled to a permit. For Lena, the opportunity was unique. And yet, so unique also was Bernard's oddness that she had hesitated to take it, had actually thought of risking the pole again with funny old Benito. At least Benito was normal. Whereas Bernard, alcohol in his blood surrogate, was Fanny's explanation of every eccentricity. But Henry, with whom, one evening when they were in bed together, Lena had rather anxiously discussed her new lover, Henry had compared poor Bernard to a rhinoceros. You can't teach a rhinoceros tricks, he had explained in his brief and vigorous style. Some men are almost rhinoceroses, they don't respond properly to conditioning. Poor devils. Bernard's one of them. Luckily for him, he's pretty good at his job. Otherwise the director would never have kept him. However, he added consolingly, I think he's pretty harmless. Pretty harmless, perhaps, but also pretty disquieting. That mania, to start with, for doing things in private. Which meant, in practice, not doing anything at all. For what was there that one could do in private? Apart, of course, from going to bed, but one couldn't do that all the time. Yes, what was there? Precious little. The first afternoon they went out together was particularly fine. Lena had suggested a swim at Takwaii Country Club followed by dinner at the Oxford Union. But Bernard thought there would be too much of a crowd. Then what about a round of electromagnetic golf at St. Andrews? But again, no, Bernard considered that electromagnetic golf was a waste of time. Then what's time for? asked Lena in some astonishment. Apparently, for going on walks in the Lake District for that was what he now proposed. Land on the top of Skidaw and walk for a couple of hours in the heather. Alone with you, Lena. But, Bernard, we shall be alone all night. Bernard blushed and looked away. I meant, alone for talking, he mumbled. Talking? But what about? Walking and talking that seemed a very odd way of spending an afternoon. In the end she persuaded him, much against his will, to fly over to Amsterdam to see the semi-demi-finals of the Women's Heavyweight Wrestling Championship. In a crowd, he grumbled. As usual. He remained obstinately gloomy the whole afternoon, wouldn't talk to Lenina's friends, of whom they met dozens in the ice cream soma bar between the wrestling bouts, and in spite of his misery absolutely refused to take the half gram raspberry sundae which she pressed upon him. I'd rather be myself, he said. Myself and nasty. Not somebody else, however jolly. A gram in time saves nine, said Lenina, producing a bright treasure of sleep-taught wisdom. Bernard pushed away the proffered glass impatiently. Now, don't lose your temper, she said. Remember one cubic centimeter cures ten gloomy sentiments. Oh, for Ford's sake, be quiet, he shouted. Lenina shrugged her shoulders. A gram is always better than a dam, she concluded with dignity, and drank the sundae herself. On their way back across the channel, Bernard insisted on stopping his propeller and hovering on his helicopter screws within a hundred feet of the waves. The weather had taken a change for the worse, a southwesterly wind had sprung up, the sky was cloudy. Look, he commanded. But it's horrible, said Lenina, shrinking back from the window. She was appalled by the rushing emptiness of the night, by the black foam-flecked water heaving beneath them by the pale face of the moon, so haggard and distracted among the hastening clouds. Let's turn on the radio. Quick. She reached for the dialing knob on the dashboard and turned it at random. Skies are blue inside of you, sang sixteen tremoloing falsettos, the weather's always. Then a hiccup and silence. Bernard had switched off the current. I want to look at the sea in peace, he said. One can't even look with that beastly noise going on. But it's lovely. And I don't want to look. But I do, he insisted. It makes me feel as though he hesitated searching for words with which to express himself, as though I were more me, if you see what I mean. More on my own, not so completely a part of something else. Not just a cell in the social body. Doesn't it make you feel like that, Lenina? But Lenina was crying. It's horrible, it's horrible, she kept repeating. And how can you talk like that about not wanting to be a part of the social body? After all, everyone works for everyone else. We can't do without anyone. Even epsilons. Yes, I know, said Bernard derisively. Even epsilons are useful. So am I. And I damned well wish I weren't. Lenina was shocked by his blasphemy. Bernard. She protested in a voice of amazed distress. How can you? In a different key, how can I, he repeated meditatively. No, the real problem is, how is it that I can't, or rather because, after all, I know quite well why I can't what would it be like if I could, if I were free not enslaved. By my conditioning. But, Bernard, you're saying the most awful things. Don't you wish you were free, Lenina? I don't know what you mean. I am free free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. He laughed, yes, everybody's happy nowadays. We begin giving the children that at five. But wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in some other way, Lenina? In your own way, for example, not in everybody else's way. I don't know what you mean, she repeated. Then, turning to him, oh, do let's go back, Bernard, she besought, I do so hate it here. Don't you like being with me? But of course, Bernard. It's this horrible place. T thought we'd be more more together here with nothing but the sea and moon. More together than in that crowd, or even in my rooms. Don't you understand that? I don't understand anything, 
she said with decision, determined to preserve her incomprehension intact. Nothing. Least of all, she continued in another tone, why you don't take Soma when you have these dreadful ideas of yours. You'd forget all about them. And instead of feeling miserable, you'd be jolly. So jolly, she repeated and smiled, for all the puzzled anxiety in her eyes, with what was meant to be an inviting and voluptuous cajolery. He looked at her in silence, his face unresponsive and very grave looked at her intently. After a few seconds Lenina's eyes flinched away, she uttered a nervous little laugh, tried to think of something to say and couldn't. The silence prolonged itself. When Bernard spoke at last, it was in a small tired voice. All right then, he said, we'll go back. And stepping hard on the accelerator, he sent the machine rocketing up into the sky. At 4000 he started his propeller. They flew in silence for a minute or two. Then, suddenly, Bernard began to laugh. Rather oddly, Lenina thought, but still, it was laughter. Feeling better, she ventured to ask. For answer, he lifted one hand from the controls and, slipping his arm around her, began to fondle her breasts. Thank Ford, she said to herself, he's all right again. Half an hour later they were back in his rooms. Bernard swallowed four tablets of Soma at a gulp, turned on the radio and television and began to undress. Well, Lenina inquired, with significant archness when they met next afternoon on the roof, did you think it was fun yesterday? Bernard nodded. They climbed into the plane. A little jolt, and they were off. Everyone says I'm awfully pneumatic, said Lenina reflectively, patting her own legs. Awfully. But there was an expression of pain in Bernard's eyes. Like meat, he was thinking. She looked up with a certain anxiety. But you don't think I'm too plump, do you? He shook his head. Like so much meat. You think I'm all right? Another nod. In every way. Perfect, he said aloud. And inwardly. She thinks of herself that way. She doesn't mind being meat. Lenina smiled triumphantly. But her satisfaction was premature. All the same, he went on, after a little pause, T still rather wish it had all ended differently. Differently. Were there other endings? T didn't want it to end with our going to bed, he speck. If feed. Lenina was astonished. Not at once, not the first day. But then what? He began to talk a lot of incomprehensible and dangerous nonsense. Lenina did her best to stop the ears of her mind, but every now and then a phrase would insist on becoming audible. To try the effect of arresting my impulses, she heard him say. The words seemed to touch a spring in her mind. Never put off till tomorrow the fun you can have today, she said gravely. Two hundred repetitions, twice a week from fourteen to sixteen and a half, was all his comment. The mad bad talk rambled on. I want to know what passion is, she heard him saying. I want to feel something strongly. When the individual feels, the community reels, Lenina pronounced. Well, why shouldn't it reel a bit? Bernard. But Bernard remained unabashed. Adults intellectually and during working hours, he went on. Infants where feeling and desire are concerned. Our Ford loved infants. Ignoring the interruption. It suddenly struck me the other day, continued Bernard, that it might be possible to be an adult all the time. I don't understand. Lenina's tone was firm. I know you don't. And that's why we went to bed together yesterday like infants instead of being adults and waiting. But it was fun, Lenina insisted. Wasn't it? Oh, the greatest fun, he answered, but in a voice so mournful, with an expression so profoundly miserable, that Lenina felt all her triumph suddenly evaporate. Perhaps he had found her too plump, after all. Nine I told you so, was all that Fanny said, when Lenina came and made her confidences. It's the alcohol they put in his surrogate. All the same, Lenina insisted. I do like him. He has such awfully nice hands. And the way he moves his shoulders that's very attractive. She sighed. But I wish he weren't so odd. Part two halting for a moment outside the door of the director's room, Bernard drew a deep breath and squared his shoulders, bracing himself to meet the dislike and disapproval which he was certain of finding within. He knocked and entered. A permit for you to initial, director, he said as airily as possible, and laid the paper on the writing table. The director glanced at him sourly. But the stamp of the world controller's office was at the head of the paper and the signature of Mustafa Mond, bold and black, across the bottom. Everything was perfectly in order. The director had no choice. He penciled his initials two small pale letters abject at the feet of Mustafa Mond and was about to return the paper without a word of comment or genial fort speed, when his eye was caught by something written in the body of the permit. Roar the New Mexican Reservation, he said, and his tone, the face he lifted to Bernard, expressed a kind of agitated astonishment. Surprised by his surprise, Bernard nodded. There was a silence. The director leaned back in his chair, frowning. How long ago was it, he said, speaking more to himself than to Bernard. Twenty years, I suppose. Nearer twenty-five. I must have been your age he sighed and shook his head. Bernard felt extremely uncomfortable. A man so conventional, so scrupulously correct as the director and to commit so gross a solecism. It made him want to hide his face, to run out of the room. Not that he himself saw anything intrinsically objectionable in people talking about the remote past, that was one of those hypnopstic prejudices he had, so he imagined, completely got rid of. What made him feel shy was the knowledge that the director disapproved disapproved and yet had been betrayed into doing the forbidden thing. Under what inward compulsion? 
T. Pre his discomfort Bernard eagerly listened. I had the same idea as you, the director was saying. Wanted to have a look at the savages. Got a permit for New Mexico and went there for my summer holiday. With the girl I was having at the moment. She was a beta minus, and I think, he shut his eyes, I think she had yellow hair. Anyhow she was pneumatic, particularly pneumatic, I remember that. Well, we went there, and we looked at the savages, and we rode about on horses and all that. And then it was almost the last day of my leave then well, she got lost. We'd gone riding up one of those revolting mountains, and it was horribly hot and oppressive, and after lunch we went to sleep. Or at least I did. She must have gone for a walk, alone. At any rate, when I woke up, she wasn't there. And the most frightful thunderstorm I've ever seen was just bursting on us. And it poured and roared and flashed, and the horses broke loose and ran away, and I fell down, trying to catch them, and hurt my knee, so that I could hardly walk. Still, I searched and I shouted and I searched. But there was no sign of her. Then I thought she must have gone. Back to the rest house by herself. So I crawled down into the valley by the way we had come. My knee was agonizingly painful, and I'd lost my soma. It took me hours. I didn't get back to the rest house till after midnight. And she wasn't there, she wasn't there, the director repeated. There was a silence. Well, he resumed at last, the next day there was a search. But we couldn't find her. She must have fallen into a gully somewhere, or been eaten by a mountain lion. Ford knows. Anyhow it was horrible. It upset me very much at the time. More than it ought to have done. I dare say. Because, after all, it's the sort of accident that might have happened to anyone, and, of course, the social body persists although the component cells may change. But this sleep-taught consolation did not seem to be very effective. Shaking his head, I actually dream about it sometimes, the director went on in a low voice. Dream of being woken up by that peal of thunder and finding her gone, dream of searching and searching for her under the trees. He lapsed into the silence of reminiscence. You must have had a terrible shock, said Bernard, almost enviously. At the sound of his voice the director started into a guilty realization of where he was, shot a glance at Bernard, and averting his eyes, blushed darkly, looked at him again with sudden suspicion and, angrily on his dignity, don't. Imagine, he said, that I'd had any indecorous relation with the girl. Nothing emotional, nothing long drawn. It was all perfectly healthy and normal. He handed Bernard the permit. I really don't know why I bored you with this trivial anecdote. Furious with himself for having given away a discreditable secret, he vented his rage on Bernard. The look in his eyes was now frankly malignant. And I should like to take this opportunity, Mr. Marx, he went on, of saying that P.M. not at all pleased with the reports I receive of your behavior outside working hours. You may say that this is not my business. But it is. I have the good name of the center to think of. My workers must be above suspicion, particularly those of the highest castes. Alphas are so conditioned that they do not have to be infantile in their emotional behavior. But that is all the more reason for their making a special effort to conform. It is their duty to be infantile, even against their inclination. And so, Mr. Marx, I give you fair warning. The director's voice vibrated with an indignation that had now become wholly righteous and impersonal was the expression of the disapproval of society itself. If ever I hear again of any lapse from a proper standard of infantile decorum, I shall ask for your transference to a subcenter preferably to Iceland. Good morning. And swiveling round in his chair, he picked up his pen and began to write. That'll teach him, he said to himself. But he was mistaken. For Bernard left the room with a swagger, exulting, as he banged the door behind him, in the thought that he stood alone, embattled against the order of things elated by the intoxicating consciousness of his individual significance and importance. Even the thought of persecution left him dismayed, was rather tonic than depressing. He felt strong enough to meet and overcome affliction, strong enough to face even Iceland. And this confidence was the greater for his not for a moment really believing that he would be called upon to face anything at all. People simply weren't transferred for things like that. Iceland was just a threat. A most stimulating and life-giving threat. Walking along the corridor, he actually whistled. Heroic was the account he gave that evening of his interr. View with the DHC whereupon, it concluded, I simply told him to go to the bottomless past and marched out of the room. And that was that. He looked at Helmholtz Watson expectantly, awaiting his due reward of sympathy, encouragement, admiration. But no word came. Helmholtz sat silent, staring at the floor. He liked Bernard, he was grateful to him for being the only man of his acquaintance with whom he could talk about the subjects he felt to be important. Nevertheless, there were things in Bernard which he hated. This boasting, for example. And the outbursts of an abject self-pity with which it alternated and his deplorable habit of being bold after the event, and full, in absence, of the most extraordinary presence of mind. He hated these things just because he liked Bernard. The seconds passed. Helmholtz continued to stare at the floor. And suddenly Bernard blushed and turned away. And part three the journey was quite uneventful. The Blue Pacific rocket was two and a half minutes early at New Orleans, lost four minutes in a tornado over Texas, but flew into a favorable air current at longitude 95 west, and was able to land at Santa Fe less than 40 seconds behind schedule time. 40 seconds on a six and a half hour flight. Not so bad, Lenina conceded. They slept that night at Santa Fe. The hotel was excellent incomparably better, for example, 
than that horrible Aurora Bora Palace in which Lenina had suffered so much the previous summer. Liquid air, television, vibrovacuum massage, radio, boiling caffeine solution, hot contraceptives, and eight different kinds of scent were laid on in every bedroom. The synthetic music plant was working as they entered the hall and left nothing to be desired. A notice in the lift announced that there were 60 escalator squash racket courts in the hotel, and that obstacle and electromagnetic golf could both be played in the park. Seven but it sounds simply too lovely, cried Lenina. I almost wish we could stay here. Sixty escalator squash courts there won't be any in the reservation, Bernard warned her. And no scent, no television, no hot water even. If you feel you can't stand it, stay here till I come back. Lenina was quite offended. Of course I can stand it. I only said it was lovely here because. Well, because progress is lovely, isn't it? Five hundred repetitions once a week from thirteen to seventeen, said Bernard wearily, as though to himself. What did you say? T said that progress was lovely. That's why you mustn't come to the reservation unless you really want to. But I do want to. Very well, then, said Bernard, and it was almost a threat. Their permit required the signature of the warden of the reservation, at whose office next morning they duly presented themselves. An Epsilon Plus Negro porter took in Bernard's card, and they were admitted almost immediately. The warden was a blonde and brachycephalic alpha minus, short, red, moon-faced, and broad-shouldered, with a loud booming voice, very well adapted to the utterance of hypnopedic wisdom. He was a mine of irrelevant information and unasked for good advice. Once started, he went on and on boomingly. Underscore 560,000 square kilometers, divided into four distinct sub-reservations, each surrounded by a high-tension wire fence. At this moment, and for no apparent reason, Bernard suddenly remembered that he had left the eau de cologne. Tap in his bathroom wide open and running. Supplied with current from the Grand Canyon Hydroelectric Station. Cost me a fortune by the time I get back. With his mind's eye, Bernard saw the needle on the scent meter creeping round and round, and like, indefatigable. Quickly telephoned to Helmholtz Watson. Upwards of 5,000 kilometers of fencing at 60,000 volts. You don't say so, said Lenina politely, not knowing in the least what the warden had said, but taking her cue from his dramatic pause. When the warden started booming, she had inconspicuously swallowed half a gram of soma, with the result that she could now sit, serenely not listening, thinking of nothing at all, but with her large blue eyes fixed on the warden's face in an expression of rapt attention. To touch the fence is instant death, pronounced the warden solemnly. There is no escape from a savage reservation. The word escape was suggestive. Perhaps, said Bernard, half rising, we ought to think of going. The little black needle was scurrying, an insect, nibbling through time, eating into his money. No escape, repeated the warden, waving him back into his chair, and as the permit was not yet countersigned, Bernard had no choice but to obey. Those who are born in the reservation and remember, my dear young lady, he added, leering obscenely at Lenina, and speaking in an improper whisper, remember that, in the reservation, children still ave born, yes, actually born, revolting as that may seem. He hoped that this reference to a shameful sub checked would make Lenina blush, but she only smiled with simulated intelligence and said, You don't say so. Disappointed, the warden began again. Those, I repeat, who are born in the reservation are destined to die there. Destined to die. A deciliter of eau de cologne every minute. Six liters an hour. Perhaps, Bernard tried again, we ought, leaning forward, the warden tapped the table with his forefinger. You ask me how many people live in the reservation. 